And now for Mail Call with Adam versus the Man. I'm very excited that our first segment in the second half of the podcast comes from Steamit.com. If you're not on Steamit.com yet, head over there, create an account, follow me at Adam Kokesh. Be a part of humanity overthrowing the centralized control of the current social media websites, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all that crap is soon going to be out out the window, including YouTube, replaced by DTube, DSound, DLive, and so many other awesome build-ons. If not, to steam it, and I am very confident in saying that I think steam it is going to be around for many years to come. But I do see that, that, that if it doesn't evolve, there will be another leap forward built upon that. But right now, we have a viable alternative. And the sooner we participate in this, the sooner we can establish a healthy new social media environment based on the blockchain rather than the central control uh, control of the likes of Zuckerberg and so many other of the robber barons of our time, if you would want to sensationalize it. So, so our first comment, and this is from a recent post of mine that I've, some of, some of my work I don't mind saying I'm, I'm quite fond of. And recently I had a call with the Avapai County Treasurer that we published as a video and as a podcast. So it's called Adam versus the Tax Man call with Yavapai County Treasurer. And let me just say about this first, as a little follow-up to that segment, that I thought the treasurer, Ross Jacobs, I I thought he engaged in in a very good way, in in a way that was a a credit to himself and and really a credit to the government, if you can have such a thing, in in that he addressed the topic uh, when confronted with the idea that taxation is theft or or that uh, the government is claiming ownership over us as taxpayers and our property. He was very polite. He was directly engaged. He engaged uh, on on a professional basis on on the points that uh, his office responsibilities would require. He engaged as a gentleman, uh, although a very wrong one in his personal perspective. And and I definitely appreciated all that. So I hope uh, he's getting more phone calls as a result of us publishing his phone number like that from people who are similarly engaging with him in in a polite manner and, and perhaps uh, accelerating his transition. So on that video, uh, our, our friend there on Steemit, who's been very helpful recently, the Johal Files. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's J-O-H-A-L. And uh, you, can find, uh, you can find this person commenting on uh, most of our uh, posts. And, and I very much appreciate the engagement. So he writes, this was great. I have to agree that taxation is indeed theft. I have huge respect for everything you are doing at Adam Kogish. I will do whatever I can to help spread the word and articulate, uh, excuse me, and educate people about this. I watched your taxation is theft tour video. You did a great job, brother. Now, I got to say just about this, uh, the, the tour that we did last year was four months on the road recruiting delegates, and we weren't focusing on bigger promotion because we wanted to make sure that the people who we were getting to be delegates signed up to be uh, convention delegates uh, at the national convention by coming first to their state conventions. It's not, it's, it's very, very easy to be a delegate in the LP that, that you go and you show up at your state convention, pretty much just raise your hand at the right time. Maybe you, you have to fill out a form, become a national party member or be a state party member, something to that effect and give them 25 bucks at most. You can be a f- member for free, by the way. You go to lp.org slash free dash membership. I'm pretty sure that's the link. If I'm getting it wrong, we'll, we'll fix it in the, the notes here. But it's, a, uh, it's something that it's a very open process. It's very easy to be a part of. But we wanted, because we knew that we were going to have more people than we needed. There are less than 1,100 slots. It's, I believe, 1,051 for 2018, and that's because of the allocation for all 50 states. And we knew we were going to have more than that, and and we were going to be in some ways competing with the old guard of the party, some of whom are on our side anyway. I, I would say most. But in, in bringing more people into the party, uh, you, you know, we wanted to, to reach out to the people who are engaged first and foremost. But in that, uh, that tour, the speech that I was doing was making the case for supporting this campaign. And it's Kokesh 2020. Uh, the organization itself is the Adam Kokesh Referendum Project because what we are doing, and it's back during that tour, we were saying I'm running for not president because we hadn't filed the paperwork yet. But it's also more accurate because as you've probably heard me say a million times by now, we are turning the U.S. presidential election into a referendum on whether or not the federal government should be allowed to exist at all. I am running for not president. The first thing I'm going to do is resign. I might not even take the oath of office. We're still working out the technicalities of that. But we are going to have a plan published online to dissolve the federal government in a peaceful, orderly, responsible manner. 
that's going to be available on our website by the 2020 Libertarian Party National Convention. And the American people will know they're not voting for me to be president for the first time. They're being given a real choice. You can have one of the old parties or you can have nobody for president and end up with 50 independent states, territories, and sovereign native nations. So anyway, that's the basic idea. And the pitch on, on the last tour was uh, summed up in a great video that, that we had edited professionally by uh, Shanti Lolly, great videographer out of Colorado who came out and videoed uh, our last few events and, and put them together into, in, into what I think is, is a great, uh, making me look much more eloquent than I am in real life. So thank you, Shanti. And, and, I, and I'm really glad, uh, the Joe Hall files, that, uh, that, that you uh, noticed that. And, and, I, and I hope that that video keeps getting around. I really think that that one lays out the case, not just for uh, dissolving the federal government, although we're going to be presenting that to the American people with the new book in, in 2019, American Freedom. Um, so stay tuned for that, and, and there, there's a different message for that, but uh, for, for giving people who, who want to see what this campaign is about, how it's set up, what the engineering of this is, what we're really doing, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that video, brother, so that, that you can uh, go back and people can go back and watch that. So I am fully on board with decentralizing everything in our country. It's really interesting to hear your view on our country having a standing arm since you were in the military. I want to hear more about your views on organized versus unorganized militia. What is your vision for the future here? Would states have unorganized militias? How would these state militias look and operate? It got me thinking about what to do about police in this country as well. Okay, so first to get into that, the point that I make in the video is, is that having a military makes us less safe, that it's un-American. And I, I prove this through a basic logical analysis of what it means to have a military, what it means to be governed, versus what the founders advocated of a free market defense, of a militia-based defense, very explicitly, actually. So. Uh, not only does having a military make us less safe, but it, it in many ways leads to us being incapable of providing the proper means of protection that the market would provide, that peaceful people would provide, that we might call a militia. Certainly what in their time with their technology and their le level of organization, they would call a militia. But to answer your question directly, I, I, I kind of have to uh, back off as, as not an expert, as, as not a central planner. Because what I'm proposing very simply within the platform here is the dissolution of the United States military in a peaceful, orderly manner. And what we would do to achieve that, uh, the first step is very easy. Bring home all the troops from abroad, sell the foreign bases, you know, bring home the, the weaponry and the assets. That's, that's an easy step one. But then you have to separate what is offensive weaponry from what is defensive weaponry. And in that sense, nukes don't qualify. Uh, aircraft carriers don't qualify, long-range bombers don't qualify, uh, missile defense qualifies, tanks qualify, individual soldiers and, and the armament necessary to supply and equip them, those certainly qualify. Of course, the best defense ultimately, I will say, of my own personal preference and what I see us evolving towards is a well-armed population that refuses to be governed by anyone. For the time being, what I'm talking about here is the transition and what I would have the authority to do as the custodian of the federal government, empowered by the vote of the American people to carry out this particular plan. So the defensive weaponry would be apportioned among the 50 states, and the offensive weaponry would be de-weaponized and sold, uh, liquidated one way or another, to provide uh, repayment to the American people through funding Social Security. So as a spun-off private institution, no longer funded by taxation, of course. So what the states do with their apportionment of those military resources is ultimately up to them. If they want, I mean, there's, I'm pretty sure somewhere there's a giant pile of M16s. So, you know, and, and, and I know I say that a little bit jokingly, but, uh, you know, it is possible that the states are going to say, well, with this new giant cache of weapons as, as our share of, of the federal government's loot, we're, uh, we're, we're going to give, we're going to make it available to the American people it's, or to, to the people in our state. It's, you know, every, everybody who is, um, I don't know, maybe there's an arbitrary age. Hopefully there'd be a more, you know, practical test. Anybody who was able to come and fill out a form, pass a safety test and prove that they can safely operate a rifle gets a rifle. Anybody who wants one, maybe, maybe that has to be how we pay back the American people. I know there's some people who would be against that. Uh, and if you want to have your safe space and pretend that violence isn't a reality of human nature at this point, you're welcome to have that on your private property. You know, I, I, I welcome that world and, and I don't think that carrying guns should be a necessity. I think we should be pretty well past that very soon after getting rid of government anyway. 
And this, this is still the fundamental right. I, I, in, in this day and age, I would, I would assert to, to be able to be armed. I would be, I'm a, more of an advocate of, of non-lethal defense. I think everybody should carry pepper spray and a taser or, or more, uh, you know, the pen pepper sprays are the ones that I'm a fan of. They're very simple, easy to carry ones. But uh, even, even if I would do that, you know, I would, I would still have uh, a, a rifle at home. I would still want that in, in, in a, as a reasonable means of defense or participating in the militia. Uh, I think most states will, at first, to get back to your question specifically, what, what will the, the state militias look like? How will they operate? Uh, I, I think at first a lot of the, the state governments are going to, just in order to absorb those resources, uh, are, are going to incorporate them with the uh, National Guards. We have those organizations under state authority already that answer uh, directly to the governor of those states. So I, I think right away that, that, that kind of takes care of itself in this transition. But where they go with that, that's not up to me. And, and my, I, I've, I've made my preferences clear. I think the sooner they localize down to the county level, the better off they will all be. Uh, but I, I leave it to the states, to each individual state, to decide what transition is best for them. I hope, as a resident of Arizona, to get to have some say in that as well in my state. And I don't know exactly what we'll be facing at that point, but I'm definitely looking forward to it. So, as I told you earlier, my father was a police detective for many years. He was a homicide detective and also worked narcotics for a bit. His views on the drug war have changed since retiring. <gasps> Thank goodness. I think some form of police would still be necessary without the government in between. Well, if, if, uh, if you're listening to this as part of the podcast, you heard the earlier segment, uh, which will probably also be available as a video, uh, about the uh, private police force in Britain that's so effective. And you say, I think some form of police would still be necessary without the government in between. Absolutely. So what, what we're going to see as a transition is this proxy for police as these private police forces. But... Uh, I think there's, there's one thing that's, that's not being accounted for in all of this, and, and really, even, even today, I, I would dare say that uh, with, with government police, I think we're better off with no police at all than government police. Yeah, it's kind of a lot of subjective analyses going to that conclusion, so take it for what it's worth. But yes, that there would be some need in today's world for some form of private police or security. If you, if, you, if you look at the problem of violence, you know, not, if you take out the victimless crimes, the non-crimes, what, what is the real problem of crime in the world today? I think you could solidly make the case that 90% that of the violence done in the world, the, the real crime, uh, even, even including theft. I mean, if you include theft, it's like just because of the scale of, of government taxation that it's like 99.9%. But even just the violence, I would say 90 plus percent of like the, the individual criminality today is, is done in the name of government. And, and of the remaining 10 percent, 90 percent of that is, is because of government due to the war on poverty, which creates more poverty, and the war on drugs, which is really a, you know, a war on drug use, is a war on you, a war uh, explicitly under Nixon, as, as, as we heard from some of the quotes that came out later, a war on minorities, uh, a war on individuals. So. Uh, you get rid of that, now you've got, you know, what, what are the remaining crimes of passion and incentive? Well, with, with real accountability, with uh, private security, we get rid of most of the crimes of, of incentive, the crimes of passion. You know, you, you can't really do much about anyway, but in, in, in at least a, a private context, uh, you can get whatever security is appropriate for yourself. And I think everybody, when it gets to that point, will be able to afford what's appropriate. I believe most people have good in their hearts and just want to live, but unfortunately there will always be some evil souls out there who want to harm slash take from others. Now, now that's, so that gets us down like to like that half, half a percent or whatever. But uh, even for them, just because we're going to free up the resources in, in, in the medical community to have, have so many uh, more effective, efficient therapies, especially through, through cannabis, through MDMA, through psilocybin mushrooms, through so many other substances that the government has kept illegal, you know, I think we're going to get rid of that. We're going to have a, a, a boon in, in mental health for humanity when we get government out of the way as well. So pretty soon afterwards, we'll, we'll take care of that last tiny bit of, of, of that kind of crime. There would, be, there would need to be some kind of police force to deal with these matters. I am against, so yeah, I, and, and when I say private security, I'm not talking about, you know, what, what we think of as like a bouncer for your, you know, for your residency. We're talking about someone who would be armed, who would have handcuffs, who would be trained, who would have, you know, uh, at least socially sanctioned uh, and market sanctioned uh, arrest capacity and would have backup and the ability to remove uh, someone if they were 
uh, insane or attacking or, or caught in, in, in some violent crime, and that they would have a facility where they could be detained. Absolutely, you would have those, those fundamental functions and features that you have in police today, at least, uh, no, I, th I think for a long time, because you're always going to have, uh, and it'll get smaller and smaller eventually down to maybe negligible over time, but yeah, you will always have the aberrations, you will always have someone losing their mind, you will always have the need for dealing with that, and, and, and I, of course the market will provide it more efficiently and, and without the overwhelming negative side effects of having government do it. Um, let's see. But if we got rid of the police force, how would crimes like murder be dealt with and investigated? Well, like I said, we've already made that case, and the example in Britain shows that they're investigating murder crime, murder and, and, and rape crimes more efficiently and effectively than government already. Um, also, what about drunk driving and these sorts of things? Now, drunk driving is, is a whole other set of issues. I'm not going to do the full analysis here because it would take forever. But um, first of all, w without government, we'd all have self-flying cars by now, if not self-driving cars. Yes, we'd have drones that could just pick you up and fly you around. We have the technology. It, it's just a matter of implementation, the fact that government has kept us from uh, developing and making these technologies more available by subsidizing the automobile industry through the infrastructure of the roads, blah, 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 blah. So I, I don't think driving drunk is going to be a real issue, but it's going to be con it's going to be addressed in the context of creating a liability for someone. Are, are you creating a threat to their to, to create bodily harm to someone else or a group of people? And, and in terms of the policies of enforcement, it, it, when roads are localized or privatized, it's going to be communities or companies that set those standards based on what people want. And I think really the standard would be this is not a recreational driving area. It's self-driving cars only because they're safer than humans behind the wheel. So that's going to be the standard. And then you're going to have like you know fun places to go off-roading or drive crazy or have races and stuff like that, and and drive drunk if that's allowed. So I am interested in hearing you expand on, upon all of this and get your ideas here. I appreciate it if you talked about how you see future police forces and how they would look in our country in a video one day. If you think there should be police of some kind. So I, I will say one more thing. I, I, hope, I hope I've expounded enough for you at this point. But one other thing is, is I see in the transition that as we get government localized to the county level, uh, that you're going to see a, a consolidation of law enforcement at that point, either around large cities or around county sheriff's departments. And then you're going to see the transition uh, or you're going to see them outcompeted uh, by private entities. Or maybe you're going to see entities break off w as, as new sovereigns with with uh, with a different concept of, of a police force entirely there so and, and i think in, in general in this transition when government is localized to the equivalent of what we have in the united states as the county level that's where you're going to see as libertarians we're done we, we can retire our message is pretty much irrelevant at that point because you'll be able to have uh, you break off and as, as your own sovereign you'll be able to form new communities based on your own rules you'll have full accountability at that local level in the places where people want something that they want to call a government and they're not going to be able to force it on any neighboring community. So that's, that's, uh, that's an important ideal that I think is much more realistic for us to strive for than the hypothetical philosophical ideal of a perfectly voluntary society. So yes, I am really advocating uh, a fundamental shift in, in tactics for the freedom movement for libertarians to, 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 to stop putting so much emphasis on ideals and philosophy, although those are important and the principles and the ethics are foundational to what we do, that what we can do to take leadership and move forward is present practical policy based on those principles that immediately improves everyone's lives. And that's what localization is. That's the promise of this. And you can see that very shortly, I mean, within a matter of decades at least, we get to the point where government is down to the county level and we're done. So. Um, Sorry, there's a, there's a little bit more here. Uh, what sort of laws will they enforce? The natural law, the demands of the market. And how would they operate and get paid? Uh, I think it, it, at the county level, you would, you would have some way for people to contribute voluntarily to a sheriff's department if they wanted to in their county. Um, and if it's by the subscription model that we see in Britain for, for more uh, direct services, you will have that option as well. So thank you very much. He ends with hashtag respect, hashtag hocus 20. And you can see more comments from the Joe Hall Files at the Joe Hall Files on steamit.com.